Broadcasting from the commodity capital of the world, Zurich, Switzerland, this is Insider's Guide to Energy. This addition to Insider's Guide to Energy is brought to you by Fidectus. Go to www.fidectus.com for more information. Welcome to Insider's Guide to Energy. I'm your host, Chris Sass, and with me as always is Johan Oberg. Johan, how's it going today? Hi, Chris. Good to be on another episode and another great week. Uh, how you been? I've been fantastic, and I've been really looking forward to this episode. Being here in Zurich, every now and then we get to find a, a nugget right in our backyard and a cool company to talk to. And this is one of those things, you know, I, I, if you look, Luca, our producer, he came from ETH. And, and he said, hey, I've got this company you need to be looking at. He pointed us in the direction. And boy, am I excited about today. No, I agree. I agree. And, we, you know, we've been, we've been worldwide picking our experts and picking our guests and finding cool topics. And, and once in, 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 in a while, uh, we find them, as you said, in our backyard and, and literally down the road uh, from where we sit today. So I, I'm really looking forward to it. But not only because they're local, because I think what they're working on for me, that is not the engineer. It seems simple, but still so revolutionary. And this is what my head is still spinning around. Why have not people done it before? What are the challenges? So I, I'm already buzzing with a lot of questions. Well, I think we should just dry, dive right into this episode. Uh, since we're both passionate about it, we know we're going to have questions. We know we're going to run up against time constraints. So let's not you know, dilly-dally any longer. Let's introduce Gianluca to the program. Gianluca, welcome to Insider's Guide to Energy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. And, you know, I'm very privileged that you, um, you know, consider us like a nugget in the backyard. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's actually really exciting. It's, it's pretty cool things you're doing. Um, but I have an advantage over our audience, as I usually say about this time, is I, I have a little bit of knowledge of who you are and what you do, but our audience has no clue yet. So maybe it makes sense for you to start by introducing yourself and, and who you work for. Sure. So I'm, I'm Gianluca Ambrosetti. I'm originally a physicist, but um, after my PhD, I started directly to work in the field of solar energy. So, I mean, um, this was, uh, you know, some years ago. And um, at the company I was working with, I um, was working for, I, um, uh, you know, was head of research. So I had the chance, you know, to go to um, a lot to ETH Zurich, uh, not far away from where I'm living. And, uh, you know, to follow all the PhD students there that were working uh, for the company. And, you know, most of them were uh, with the lab of uh, Professor Aldo Steinfeld. And uh, so, you know, I sitting there and looking at the things were mainly optics, um, you know, so geometrical or non-imaging non optics things. Yeah. Um, those were mainly the works that we were doing there. And, um, but nearby they were working on uh, synthetic fuels produce thermochemically, so these high temperature glowing uh, reactors. Uh, and so that looks interesting, you know. So several years sitting there brought me um, in 2016, and together with other people there also from the lab, to the idea to try to bridge this decade-long research into the market. And this is a bit... Um, you know, this is a bit the inception of Sinalion. So I moved from myself to yeah, uh, how Sinalion came to be in uh, early 2016. All right. So, so just to recap, what I heard is you were physicists that worked in optics, that saw these guys doing synthetic fuel, and you said, hey, this is pretty cool. And now you're at a synthetic fuel company based here in Zurich, Switzerland. Is that the short version of what I just heard? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> All right. So, so our audience also may you know, want a little education. So tell us a little bit about the company, uh, maybe just a short glimpse of what you're doing. So apparently you're doing something at optics and sun and you're making synthetic fuel. That's what it sounded like. So maybe share about that. So basically, um, the mission is really to um, 
to produce renewable synthetic fuels, so fuels that are fully um, compatible with existing infrastructure and that they are, uh, you know, they can be used by existing uh, engines, and, you know, as I say, they use also the existing distribution infrastructure, which is, has been built over the decades. And, um, but they are renewable. So when you use them, basically they put out the same amount of CO2 that is being uh, used and picked up by the production. So how does that work? How do we do this? And basically, I mean, what we do is, at the simplest form is we reverse combustion. You know? when, you, when you do burn a fuel, you, um, you basically take a hydrocarbon, so a fuel, you combine it with oxygen, you have a flame, the flame releases um, heat, you derive a process, and then from, uh, as a chemical output, you have CO2 and uh, uh, water vapor. What we do is reverse it, take water vapor, CO2, put in a lot of energy, and then come back to the fuels and somewhere the oxygen. So this is the center part, and this is where I come now to um, to the way we do it. You know, I mean, uh, we need to put in a lot of energy, and the energy we put in with Synhelion is solar heat. So with the mirror, with the optics, we concentrate the solar radiation in a point where we can generate very high temperatures, and to some device, with through some devices, we deliver this heat to a process that is reversing the combustion to generate our fuels. So, so, so using solar, uh, I looked at a few of the, your, uh, the images of the solar park at the big tower where, where you reverse the, 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 the sun to. Does this work on, on all solars or is this dedicated specifically for, for producing um, uh, the fuel or is this, could you, could you put your solutions on any solar farm or are they dedicated specifically for for, for the, these solutions? That's a very good question. And uh, I mean, we, what we use is basically uh, a solar tower technology. It means that what is on the top of the tower where the concentrated solar radiation comes is our own development. But the tower and the heliostats, uh, I mean, standard heliostats and standard tower technology can be used. So the fact that we are using, we are leveraging on many components that are already being used for, let's say, for instance, in for the production of uh, power with, uh, let's say, the more known and conventional concentrated solar power plants. I saw that, that you had. It. Oh, go ahead. Go yes, that, but that just to clarify, and, that, and there might be another stupid question, but does that mean that that your technology uh, with the solar tower? Could, could you basically put a solar tower anywhere on any solar plant without reducing the, the, the capacity, the normal capacity of a solar plant, but just adding uh, extra value to a, a solar plant? Or is it dedicated specifically for, for this? Um, no, I mean, in, you will need to have a dedicated area. You know, like the solar radiation comes uh, on the surface, you know, that you will be have like, I mean, in our case, you have mirrors. You know, All right. Okay. Panels, you have mirrors that concentrate solar radiation. And, um, and, but in any case, whatever you will put on a surface, I mean, this will be dedicated to this use. I mean, you cannot have like a co use because the surface is already maximally exploited for the purpose. So if I have a PV field to produce electricity, or even a, like an existing CSP field to, to concentrate it on top of the tower and produce electricity. I mean, you know, the amount of catch up, captured solar radiation and the, the incoming uh, radiative power is used for that and you cannot use it double. So uh, I, will, I will need to, of course, use it to find a dedicated surface, a dedicated land piece where to do my thing. <laughs> power. Well so that, no, that was that was the smart answer to the stupid question. Thanks. <laughs> it's not at all a stupid question, you know. Like, so I, I saw in your videos on, on the website several different solar options. I, I saw at one point it looked like 2019. You had a, a big disc type thing on the top of ETH of, of, of one of the buildings there uh, that generated a fair amount of heat, and you, you made small quantities. Then it looked like the company had moved on to maybe a medium size production. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that was in Spain or if that was, um, I think it was in Spain, if I recall correctly. 
And it was pretty cool because now now you're starting to get something pretty big and, and you were able to produce, I think, you know, aviation fuel at that point, um, is, is if I recall from, from that. Mm -hmm. and then if I'm not mistaken, you were building a, an industrial scale size, basically plant or, or using one that existed perhaps to, to proof the concept out. Will you pretend then when you build your own to produce your own fuel, is that, is that kind of the history where the company's gone so far? Is, am I capturing this right? This is actually a very good description of our timeline, you know, how it was so far. So basically right now we are implementing a, a full industrial scale system on a tower that, however, is not our, our, our own tower. It's a tower of the German Aerospace Center. But we are installing uh, on top all the key components on this tower that we are renting. And ironically enough, even the mirrors of the field are done by what is now seen in Germany. So we have there many components on that uh, plant, but it's not yet our own plant. This will be the next step that we are going to do still in Germany to have like a really A to Z plant owned and build and uh, so built and owned if you want to do the sequence <laughs> and uh, operated by um, um So I, I guess what I wonder, I don't think of wearing like my bathing suit in Germany all the time because it's not always sunny there. So if, if, if I'm Zurich Airport and I've got this contract where it looks like you guys have already sold your fuel to Zurich Airport to, to fly and, you know, and I need to go on this business trip next week and it's been cloudy for some period of time in Germany, what happens? This is, a, again, a very, very good point. And it's uh, because this facility that we are building in Germany is not a commercial facility. I mean, it's a fully industrial facility, but it will not produce commercially. It will, it will produce on good days. And, uh, and it's important to say, which is not so intuitive, is that a nice sunny day in Germany is not different than a nice sunny day in the uh, desert, in the sense that the intensity of the sun in a clear, dark blue uh, sky day is fairly constant all over the planet. But the difference is, of course, in a good location, in a less good location, is the number of days. So you would not put a plant, a commercial plant in Germany. However, what you do is you put a plant you are wanting, you know, to be a first of its kind there because you have around you the whole infrastructure of supporting companies. Uh, you have like one of the best environments of the world, you know, to, to, um, to build and operate such a plant. But you know, to answer your questions, I mean, uh, you would you, you would risk to. <laughs> <laughs> to have your plane, to your plane, to have your plane there waiting a longer time for the fuel, <laughs> if you would be rely on that. So this is also why our commercial plans are not foreseen in Germany, and uh, we foresee the first ones uh, most likely uh, the first ones in Spain, where you have uh, yeah, uh, better solar irradiation. All right. Well, I'll go visit you in Spain. Germany is, is not as exciting on a cloudy day, but Spain I, I think would be a fun fun place to be in the sun. So, so you're going to put the plants down in Spain. That makes sense. Um, it may make sense to talk a little bit more about the technology because I, I conceptually understood from your description that you kind of reverse combustion. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked about having this tower. We talked about these mirrors and it's kind of cool. If you watch the videos, I see the mirrors focus and they you know, concentrate the, the energy into that single point. I think many of us that watch this podcast or listen to this podcast have seen that. Um, what other elements do we need is, to, to make this happen? I mean, I said, you know, um, the, somehow the fil rouge, the connecting element between, let's say, all the declination of our technologies go through high temperature heat generated with concentrated solar. So like a very important element is what happens on top of the tower and especially how you convert the concentrated solar, uh, solar radiation into heat. And for this, we have a device which is called a solar receiver. There you will heat up what we call again in jargon, solar energy people like to have fancy jargons, what we call a heat transfer fluid, which is simply a gas carrying around the heat but, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the important thing is this device is very central to heat efficiently this energy, this heat carrier uh, that we will then drive our process. 
Then we come to the next step, which is the reactor where I do, um, let's say, perform my reactions. And um, again, you know, to put this a bit uh, to coming down for like the highest level description of the reversal of combustion, to put it a bit more technically, uh, oh, let's say there is a whole family of reactions that have what we in jargon call uh, that are what we in jargon call endothermic. It means that they require a lot of heat to be operated and this is you know this is the step of the combustion reversal you know you need to put in a lot of energy and this you do in chemistry with uh, endothermic reactions and you put in heat this heat that i have captured with the receiver and so basically this is like very uh, like pretty much in a nutshell how the process is uh, working there is however a very important third element and um I may anticipate a question is uh, that uh, that you may ask is the is the one okay the sun shines during the day nice but what happens during the night time and for this I need something to bridge this and how we do bridge this we bridge this with a thermal energy storage which is like a battery but for heat and here again this is the beauty of heat heat storage is much less expensive than uh, electricity storage. So I can store my heat and produce 24 seven with, uh, with something with like, let's say a battery that is much, much less expensive than an electricity battery. This is to describe a bit like the core components that we use, you know, they make a bit the magic, you know, like the interplay, uh, these components make a bit the magic of <laughs> what is happening on top of the tower. <laughs> So, so if we expand a little bit on on the technology, uh, you need to produce a lot. If if I get this, you know, if, if it's going to be airline fuel or, or jet fuel, it, it requires volumes. Uh, how big, size wise, is this needed? Because you would need a lot of mirrors, you would need a lot of heat. Is there is there a minimum, or is there because it, it requires a bit of land mass to build this? several square kilometers, several tens. I mean, and if you want to really cover uh, like the fuel, uh, the, the global fuel demand, this is going to be uh, thousands of square kilometers. This is really a, a very important, um, um, this is very like an important consequence of wanting to transition to renewable fuels. And I think it's an important message to give is that you really do need this scale. You know, I mean, we have a technology that is uh, somehow more efficient and therefore we will require less land than other technologies. But it's not that we require one tenth. We may require 30% less to say you a number. And uh, the, what we do need with our or competing technology is really, really a very large the surfaces. Uh, to really be able to produce the quantities uh, of fuel that um, that can you know that are required to fully substitute uh, uh, the fo fossil counterparts that you use today. So my experience, having been in, in, in IT and being a technologist, is doing anything at scale gets hard. It, it's, it's always easy to give a demonstration. It's it's a little bit harder to do it in small scale. So. I, I put in the chat window when you were talking, you talked about the size. One of the things that just comes to mind is just keeping that many mirrors clean. How, how do you keep this? Because it looked kind of precision, at least in the video I watched. This didn't look like just a mirror there. I mean, there, there were actuators controlling the mirror to make sure they lined up. They looked focused. Um, I'm assuming they're also very clean. So so how, how does this operationally take place? How, how do you manage something like that in scale? I mean, this has been solved for existing uh, solar tower plants. You know, those those have like they have easily a, a mm. one square kilometer of mirrors. One square kilometer of mirror means that like, the land surface of the plant is easily to three square kilometers. The towers are 200, 250 meters high, and uh, so you know this has been solved. This means that you need to clean them. You need to clean them fairly regularly, otherwise you have a soiling effect which degrades the efficiency. The good thing is that you have uh, quite a lot of time to do this without corrupting the operations because you can do this during night time. And, um, but you need to clean them. There are uh, you know, companies that have developed automatic mm -hmm. cleaning systems. Uh, I mean, another alternative that you made that is, of course, uh, often uh, appreciated 
um, locally is when you use local workforce to do this because people get a job to, um, to clean that. You also need to be careful in the water usage. Of course, when you are in the desert, water is a rare resource. So there are also schemes to recover this. But yeah, I mean, uh, to make a long story short, it is uh, something that has been done and carried out and solved by large existing installations. Yeah, understood. Yeah, I, I, like I said, it, it's just one of those things. Now, you talked about water. Um, so in the process, are you using external water or is this kind of this moisture in the air that, that comes in with the heat to generate the fuel? I mean, it depends basically on how you source the input. I mean, you will need water um, as a chemical input to the process. So this water you need to source. If you take the CO2 from direct air capture, in that case, you will have water coming along. If you um, use biomass as a carbon input or uh, as, a, as a precursor to your fuel, uh, you will have also water coming along. If you use um, natural gas or biogas, uh, you will need to have it externally, which means that you will need to source it. And either you have it available from a water network or a river or a lake, or you will need to, um, to desalinate water and, uh, and bring this in. And this is like a part that, uh, that, you know, that you need to take into account when you develop a site. So, so if we look at economics um, around this, we talked about the science of it, something that um, kind of triggers me a little bit in terms of probably not a challenge today, but for sure it will be moving forward because a lot of the new renewable, be that wind, solar, or, or something else, will require big land masses. Is there a, do you see there's a challenge here if, if you are a landowner, or let's say you're a farmer or someone else, and, and you have a dedicated spot of land that you want to you want to dedicate to renewable energy, is there a fight for, for the land? Uh, and what, what then will be the biggest ROI of, of purely solar panels uh, or, or something like uh, that you do? I mean, as these places normally tend, to, as our technology tend to go to places that are desertic and there are many deserts and deserts are normally not very uh, sought after, uh, there is plenty of space. There is plenty of space available. This does not mean that there will never be any competition for land. I can imagine that down the road when, when you know, these things will scale to the tens, uh, to the thousands of square kilometers, there will be locations close to, let's say, centers and uh, perhaps networks, uh, power networks, or for what it matters, water networks, or so that we may have like a, a big advantage. But we do, in our case, really try to develop technologies that are independent as much as we can from these dependencies, especially from the electricity grid, because we do believe that um, the transition to renewables is nowadays so much geared um, towards electricity. Renewable electricity plays such a central role that uh, it will be hard, it will be soon, and this is not something that, I mean, this is, of, of course, now common knowledge. I mean, there will be a shortage simply also because we are phasing out, um, let's say, the best kind of power plant, the base load power plant, coal power plants, nuclear power plants. And um, therefore, we do not, we do not want, we, we believe that this is one of really our cornerstones to try to develop technology that do not need to rely on an electricity grid providing renewable power. So for this, we are a bit more independent in location choice. And yeah, I mean, there, uh, there is an enormous amount of amazing places where we can do this. I really like, yeah. So, so one thing then, if, if we look at, you, you can put this anywhere. Let's say you, you put it in the, in the desert. There's plenty of space. There's plenty of sun. Uh, no, no problems in terms of this one. But if we look at renewables, in terms of SAFs, so sustainable aviation fuel, re renewable in general, you're also, by doing that, by default, putting yourself quite far away from the demand of, of the actual fuel, which means that you have a sustainable challenge here in terms of getting it from where you produce it to where it's used. Or am I, am, am I missing the point here? No, I, I mean, this is actually a, a very, very good point because here you come 
to the core in the beauty to the core beauty of fuels fuels have i mean what fuels are unsubstitutable in or ha very hard to substitute in airplanes because of their gravimetric and volumetric energy density the same uh, energy density this so the, the um, this high energy density makes them easy to transport and if you think this is what we are doing i mean we don't transport i mean natural gas you know how challenging it can be hydrogen we have heard power even i mean if you want to like you know get like pv electricity from north africa you need high voltage dc all that but fuel you know we transport no problem fuel across the whole world and this is because of this energy density that makes the transportation impact economically but also environmentally marginal and this is the beauty of fuel so you can really position yourself away from your user and transport it to the user with minimal impact. I was thinking maybe we could change gears a little bit and talk a little bit about the company. We started by saying you're here in Zurich. You, you, you mentioned your personal bio that you, you, you kind of worked through at the ETH. How, how does a company start from ETH research and become a commercial entity? I mean, um, to be fair, like the original ETH spin-off was the company that uh, my co-founder and co-CEO Philip Furler started. Um, I was already working for uh, this other company back at the time when I was working with the lab. So I was already in the, let's say, working in, let's say, in the business side. But at the end, it works always in a certain sense, um, in a similar way. Or I mean, at the end, you have an idea, you have a vision, and you need to find some early backers because this is <laughs> this is the most important thing. You need to find people that say nice, you know, like you sketch a vision, a roadmap, a business plan, or you know, not even a business plan. You you need to find people that at the end are putting some money on the table, and. Um, Back in our days, we had like, let's say, an extra challenge. Um, our extra challenge is that we had like people that say, nice idea, guys, we're going to finance this, but you need to find an industrial partner. And this was our big challenge. So we actually, uh, through uh, Giorgio Mazzanti, one of, uh, one of the key persons in the foundation in the constitution of Sinelion and uh, our strategic advisor, through him, we got to ENI, and ENI decided that when they heard what was, uh, you know, this technology and how it was possible after, you know, long calculations and modeling and everything, decided to step into the project in 2016, and we started with the collaboration agreement. So I would say that what it really takes, what it really took us, was this collaboration agreement with ENI. It's also what basically gave the security to investors that we are not simply telling some story or that it was not too academic uh, or... Because I guess that, you know, this is a challenge when you want to spin off a company from a place like ETH is as many people will ask you, nice, I mean, you know, this is beautiful research. We know it's great. This ETH is one of the best universities of the world. But is this going to become a commercial product? Has this this potential? And uh, and even if you show this, is are you able to bridge this? Is Are your economics and your estimates uh, solid enough? When you have a ENI saying that they believe it, you know, it's fairly easier. Cool. So, so where is the company today? I, I, I think, you know, we talked about the different size implementations. You said that was a good roadmap where the company is. So mm -hmm. where are you in the commercial life cycle of your companies? You've got more than proof of concept, it seems. Um, I mean, we are really now putting together, I mean, and, and this is, this is a, a literal statement that says we're really completing the first plant where everything is integrated together on the tower. So this is really going to be like the first uh, um, industrial scale implementation of our technology. So this is really, let's say, I would say like perhaps the technically uh, most important step, uh, um, which we're going to conclude this summer followed by the second very relevant step of having really integrated everything and having done a plant A to Z. So let's say technology-wise, we come to the, um, the big step is this summer. From the company operation standpoint, 
I do see this with the completion of the plant in Germany because then it means Simeon is capable of taking a piece of flat land and putting on coordinating stakeholders and everything, putting up a plant. This means that by 23, we'll be in the position to operate commercially, which is what we are also already foreseeing for the plants that are in a better location for production than uh, um, Germany. And as I mentioned before, the Spanish project. But I'm, we are really now, now come bringing the, the, the two elements together. Like, I mean, we're really hitting now the, the, the major cornerstone. The first one is so, so for the next step, uh, uh, just obviously there are business secrets and, <laughs> and, and confidential things. But if I just look a little bit in terms of, for example, you we, we work a lot now with PPAs, for, for example, wind parks, etc., Mm -hmm. uh, if you're looking at investments for another park, how does that next investment, is it business driven? So you have an airline, you have something else coming to you that we want this and then together you build it? Or is it more of the, an American analogy here in terms of the Kevin Costner fil film, you know, if we build it, they will come kind of a, a prospect. H how does that financing work? Because obviously every plant will have uh, an additional investment. I mean, building up the demand side is very important and we have partners in that space and we are working on this and um, this is for sure uh, uh, something very important. But nobody needs to, uh, no, we cannot uh, fall under the illusion that plan financing or other devices will allow us to finance these first plants. So these first plants are financed uh, through equity and possibly through grants. Because uh, the technology needs to be bankable, and this is the so the first step is to have like a few of these per land uh, with an output that is you know you need a few years of output and then perhaps it's uh, in the situation where you can go um, to the next level. But before that, uh, it's uh, I mean uh, equity will play a central role, and of course you need to build up the demand side. But I mean like. You know, when you put in equity, you can always see it a bit into from from several perspectives. Now you can see it also from the perspective of this plant, as as you say, you know, <laughs> they will come. I mean, the sense that you should that you, at the same time you there is something in there that that you can capitalize in the value of the company yeah, because of course this is also whole experience and some, as something that you can then use to deploy it uh, in the success of the plants. You mentioned earlier in the conversation that. Um, you're a net neutral technology, right? You basically drop into existing um, engines and, and the like. Is there an impact from, as, as these plants scale up from the amount of heat that we absorb? So is there going to be a new problem down the road, whereas today, maybe some of that energy would be reflected off into space. If we start absorbing massive amounts of heat, does that change things? Is that an environmental problem or is it already absorbed? And I just don't understand the, the implications that it, it's not bouncing off into space. <laughs> It's also a very interesting point. And uh, I mean, the fact that you are right, I mean, this you have, I mean, it's the same thing with, uh, uh, let's say, with, uh, would say, with photovoltaic parks and everything. I mean, if you start to have large areas that instead of having the albedo, the clearer albedo of a desert that would reflect radiation back, at least part of the radiation back into the sky, because, you know, so I mean, what you see as, uh, as uh, clear, it doesn't, I mean, it's not clear in the full. So let's say our bright is not bright in the full spectrum of um, of the solar spectrum, but you know, this is a more technical thing. But let's say it's so that you put something that is more absorbing, it will absorb more. And I mean, if it would be very efficient, it would convert everything into electricity and you would not have this sort of heat islanding or local heating. While with less efficient technologies, you may have this effect. It's a complex thing. It's also a debated subject. What we know is that on the scale that we are targeting, we are still away from this. I mean, if you, let's say, target, you know, the surfaces uh, for, uh, let's, say, uh, let's say, a good part of the jet fuel demand, you are still away from these very, very large areas. But it's it's a point that, um, that should be considered. Should also be considered a, a bit like uh, beyond this macroscopic pure effect, but also locally, you know, like you may have like a local effect on the climate if you start to, on a larger area, uh, differentiate the way, uh, you know, the, the, the heat is absorbed or uh, stored uh, by the ground and the surroundings. Like if you put a lake in a place and you take it away, the local climate will change significantly.
But so I guess what I think I heard your answer saying is interesting scientific question, but this, the results that you have, it doesn't seem for the jet fuel demand to actually cause an impact at your scale. Is that what I heard you say, at least theoretically? Yes, I would say that, I mean, I just think that, you know, you need to reach a scale uh, where this may has an impact that, you know, in a certain sense, I say, when I reach this scale, I will think about it. <laughs> yeah, no, I just, just, just curious, right? I mean, I, I just, if, if we reflect energy off and start absorbing more energy, I just wonder if we change one problem for another or if it's really net neutral. And, and I, I just don't know. I'm not, I'm not a scientist to understand that. I just was curious. Well, no. As I said, I think it's it, it's an uh, it's an important point. But I mean, with the surfaces we are talking, the effect is uh, negligible, or let's say second order with respect to other places like reforestation and other uh, and other things that would cover larger area. But I would not uh, let's say I would not as all these things. You know, those, those are complex things, and I tend to respect all these kind of challenges and never brush them away. You know? But I, for what we know, for the surfaces that we are talking about, this is a second order effect. So you have technology now. You've got some intellectual property that you developed. I think you were saying you know, the key tends to be at the top of the tower is the way you were describing what's going. So you still have scientists like yourself that are involved in this project. So, so where does this go? How does this evolve, become more efficient or grow? What, what are the next steps? So assuming commercial success end of summer, what happens now? I mean, there are several things that you need to do, you know, I mean, you still need to scale the technology. I mean, you need to scale it uh, business wise. You need to scale also the components and, you know, like having, a, you know, there are several ways how you can do. You, of course, can create a model and replicate it, but you also need to scale this, the module itself. You will have you have components that uh, you will always uh, that won't be modular and that you will need to improve. And of course, there are also the next generation, you know, we bring one technology, one first uh, technology to the market, but we have a pipeline of technologies that we do believe that in the next year will then, once we have debugged and also, let's say, um, uh, we have like the risk, uh, the, let's say that the first version, we can go to a bit more ambitious one, but also with more reward. So there is still a lot to do. And, uh, you know, as it goes with the growth of the companies, also that um, you lend to do less science and to do more and more management, uh, which is uh, sometimes nice. But of course, sometimes you do miss, <laughs> you do miss really like doing more research. So, um, yeah. Which obviously brings it into the next level where from, from, from the science to the technology to the business, which, which is also... Uh, an interesting part. So, so coming back to that a little bit, we, we talked a lot about airline fuel and, and, and looking at the volumes around this, I, I guess it's, <laughs> you have quite, quite a few years to go on this. <laughs> exactly. But it, it, are there other areas that you're looking into or already working with, or uh, I'm just curious because we, we tend to, at least me, focus here on the airlines. Are there other, ad, other areas that you are now looking into or already deployed? I mean, with the airlines, we have, of course, a partnership with uh, Swiss and the Lufthansa Group, of course. This is, um, with, with them, we are working, uh, we have several working groups and several contact points. This is a very rewarding collaboration. But we have even um, uh, collaborations beyond uh, uh, aviation. We have, like, for instance, uh, the AMAG Group invested in, uh, uh, in Sinelio. AMAG Group is the is one of the main importers of Switzerland and importer of the Volkswagen Group. So we have we are also looking at road transportation. We have uh, um, also we are also considering maritime application. And last but not least, uh, there are also declinations that go beyond fuel. And this is because we have this high temperature heat, so we can drive these. Uh, very energy demanding reactions that uh, are necessary to produce fuel but we can also drive other industrial processes that demand a lot of heat that are very energy demanding as for instance cement and this is why we have uh, already uh, like a longer time partnership with uh, the, one of the world uh, leaders in cement production cmex 
and uh, also invested in Sinalion, and with them we are developing ways of produce solar cement. With the uh, how does the economics work? So the science is awesome. It's it's super exciting. You got me geeking out because I, I can't help but watch your cool videos and, and, <laughs> and, and talk about all the neat stuff we're doing. But with most renewables, in my experience, is it's an economic equation, right? The, the current supply costs a certain amount. Yes, there's mandate to get rid of and get CO2 out, but the adoption rate tends to reflect the cost of production or is it cheaper or equivalent or slightly more expensive than perhaps, you know, getting jet fuel another way. How does all this work out? I mean, we do target to have costs that are comparable to the today's fossil fuel costs. I mean, we have different technologies that have different degrees of uh, renewable uh, fraction. We have uh, technologies um, that produce fuels that have a reduction, CO2 emission reduction potential that uh, um, are is, is around 40% that could produce on a par production costs on a par of the today's market price for uh, jet fuel, which is around, I don't know, 50 cents, 50 Swiss francs cents per liter, you know, to put in a ballpark figure. And with, uh, um, and with, as we increase the renewable fraction, you know, to go to fully renewable fuels, the price increase to come slightly below uh, the today's reference, which is around of the two, today's advanced biofuels uh, have prices around two francs per liter. And we have technologies that can achieve that uh, projectively at lower cost, but still at higher cost than, than, the, um, than the, let's say that what the, the today's fossil fuel cost is. I think that there is, uh, I mean, some, <laughs> I know that there are some other companies that claim uh, prices that are on a par with today's uh, fuels, uh, fossil fuel demand. But I mean, with the today's prices, we see this as uh, yeah, very challenging, even analyzing competition, competing technologies. So this is a bit the space where you move in, but it's not going to be 10 times. I mean, there are also technologies now with prices that are 10, 20 times higher. And this we do believe is simply a no-go. We do believe it's no go because society cannot uh, afford, you know, like to have such a hike in price. I mean, we see what happens just because the energy prices increase, um, you know, like, and these increases, those are very, very steep increases. Uh, those would be not accepted. And I guess that also, I mean, this would be very challenging, you know, I mean, it would be very challenging to accept by society. So we do, even as a mission, target costs that are comparable to today's prices. So, so looking at this, we, we have on the show quite a lot of times moving in. We, we have the technology, we have the market, but we have a third leg in regards to on this show, which is also very much of regulatory and, and politics uh, around this. Uh, and, and if I look at this, and, and there's a big debate on, on airline travel in general, and how can we reduce that? They talked about electric flights and that there's a number of different things. But are there any incentives here uh, for, from either the European Union or, or from the airline collaboration of moving from, from, from traditional jet fuel into more of a uh, SAF or sustainable uh, energy fuel? Is there any, because if the price level is this, it's still, it's still a better way to go for the airline because this is the biggest cost they have. I mean, this is, again, a very good point. And there are several schemes. I mean, there are rules uh, in the Renewable Energy directi Directives. There are quotas that are being, either they are already implemented or they will be implemented about like introducing a fraction of sustainable aviation fuel in your consumption. Not only for the users, there's going to be also for the importers. They have like, uh, they have obligations. So this is a first, so quotas will be, one first system. The other one is, of course, to support the technological uh, deployment. This is something that, at least in Switzerland, we had the, the opportunity to at least uh, um, mention to the government with whom we are talking. Um, and um, this is, of course, another way of, like, I mean, like direct I mean, financing. It can be also like it does not need to be a fond perdu. It can also be like, like uh, you know, like grants. 
um, like, I mean, like um, I would say, like uh, credits or like system that can support you. And uh, last but not least, it's also at the end uh, the transition uh, to be made by I mean by the customer. And some of them actually want to have the the, the emission credits. So this is already a market where there are people that want that companies that want because of their ASG uh, compliance. Uh, demand that they, they they will they ask to have credits you know to fly on SAF so that they can put in their books but it's also at the end something for the um, for the end customer I mean we are willing to um, sometimes to spend more you know to have a bio product to have something it will probably become the time where it will be our own choice to um, to spend something more to have like the actual fuel perhaps tanked into the plane or something. I mean, it needs to be something that is a bit different than an abstract way uh, as it is today. But I think that there is a big space for improvement there. I mean, we know from, you know, let's say, the, the consumer market that it is possible that the consumer shoulders extra costs if um, she or he believes this is actually bringing like an added value. I, I like the fact that there's going to be an ESG component to flying because I'm on the commercial side of a business and I have to take planes to finish my career out. So I, I'm happy to see that come <laughs> along the way. And I, I, I'm, the company I work for will also be happy to see that so that we can keep our sustainability goals. That that to me is an exciting time. Interested a little bit about life at your company. So how many employees do you have so far and, and what's it like working there? Because it, it looks kind of cool. Yeah. So, I mean... Cool is very cool. <laughs> it's especially cool not in COVID times where we are not in home office and so where we can all stay together. Uh, is uh, I mean, is is as good as it gets. You know, you have like we have like an amazing team, and I'm not doing you know like this because everybody says oh, our team is amazing. No, the team is really really amazing. It's what, what makes the team amazing? What what's special about the team where you're at? I mean, there are so many things. I mean, first is that everybody is very, very competent. Then everybody is very dedicated. And then, you know, we really managed to to form, a, um, you know, a culture. It, it's very interesting, you know, like I believe that the company culture is something so strong that once you have it in a company, you can change people, but this dominates. And, you know, when you start a business at the beginning, it's known, it's you, it's another one here to people. But then it grows and then it becomes this, this um, holistic ensemble of people. And I think what we have is really special. There is really a, a special chemistry and everybody's committed and, uh, and the people really feel the mission. And it's, uh, yeah, so it's, we are really, I mean, it's, it's really a holistic system where we are the sum, we are more than the sum of the single parts. You know? There is really a collective. You know? But of course, like the, the competencies of everybody, uh, from the technology to um, marketing and communication to everything, you know, to finance. We have like a, an amazing team, really. I mean, and I <laughs> really, really mean it. Every time I'm so grateful. That, and I sometimes think how lucky, I mean, it's it's strange. You think where um, so easily can go wrong and it didn't. And, you know, we really have like, a, I mean, we recently merged, you know, like we integrated the German company, Sinelio uh, Germany also with them and it's working fantastically. And this is, uh, so now coming to the number, we are around um, 22. We are going, we are growing to be around 25 by mid of the year. And um, yeah, so it's still a, quite a small company. Still, still a young company with, with growth in front of you, hopefully. It, sound, it, it sounds pretty exciting to me. Um, I, as we're getting towards time, I, I think I have you know one last question. If, if I were a 20 something, scientists looking to go into renewables and all what's the path you'd recommend so you've done it you've, you've gone there and you've taken your career and, and gone and developed some renewables what do you recommend to someone just starting the career today what, what should they do i mean i would say something that i should not say but i mean i would say that study physics simply because it's the most beautiful thing that you can ever study <laughs> and then you can go anywhere but you know once uh, once you study physics is uh, yeah i mean you go to the depth of things and it's then it's then a pleasure you know to try to, uh, to to bring these very theoretical things into the reality 
but this is perhaps not the most usual <laughs> comment I can make. Uh, and um, on the other side, I think that more than what you study, what is important is try to do something. I mean, and I'm meaning this especially in Switzerland, because uh, I know in America it's different. People have an entrepreneurial spirit in Silicon Valley. People do like to build companies here. You know, we have like a very solid market for a job market uh, in, in Zurich. You can go work in many institutions that will give you a good salary, a good security. You will, you know, you have an easy life, a beautiful life. And uh, yeah, but this is a pity because uh, entrepreneurship and starting something is, it's, you know, it's, you cannot explain what it gives you. I mean, there is, there are no words. It's, it's like an amazing experience and it's so rewarding. And uh, this is also where you can make really a difference. I mean, in a company, an existing established company, this is challenging. It's not impossible. You can raise you to become the CEO of the company and then perhaps try to steer it. But when you build your own things, this is an on, on other scale. And what you learn, the, the breadth of things that you learn, uh, the, the, I mean, it's simply, you know, it's one of the most, uh, a really rewarding thing and also one of the mix with the highest potential because studying is good doing a PhD doing a research is very good but still where you make a difference is when you do a company and you bring it to the market if you want to like I mean because at the, e at the end the energy transition is made of you know I mean the energy needs to be produced and transformed and extracted and uh, this this needs you know this need to be done it's so, so I hear the passion. I'm excited that you shared that. Uh, as a co-founder or founder of a company here in Zurich, I, I totally agree with that. Um, so I, I guess now that you've done that and you do that, so what's your vision? Five years from now, 10 years from now, and I look back, what have you done? What contribution have you made? I don't know. I, I cannot judge my contributions. I would let other judge what, was my, what my contribution was. I mean, I hope that Sinalian will really be a, a player. You know, like I remember the times when we started with this, he and I already on board and we were going out and people were saying, what are you doing? And, you know, I always quote my sister saying, my brother, my brother transforms water into gasoline. You know, and if we, with Sinalian, manage you know to really open up this very important field of uh, sustainable uh, fuels which i think is necessary for the energy transition then this would be a great achievement what my contribution will be to that i don't know it's not for me <laughs> fair, to enough. <laughs> fair enough johan do you have any final thoughts as we wind up here I have plenty of thoughts and, and I thought it was really fascinating and, and really good for you to, to come up. I know we're really pushing time, but we can go on forever. But I have a, maybe one last question, if you can give us a short answer. I, I love the passion from both of you guys, the, all the entrepreneurs. I get a little bit jealous being the corporate guy on, on here, but uh, you know, all, all, all respect to you. But one, one, one thing that kind of um, I'm a bit curious around is one of your first partners, you said, was Any, which is a totally different beast in terms of, of corporate organizations, etc. How does that collaboration work where you have a, a young startup with, you know, that came on to the journey together, where, whereas in, in, in large corporations, there might be a project manager assigned to a project. They're slightly different approaches. How does this work? Yeah, it's again a very important and fair and uh, relevant point and um, it depends a lot on the partner you know this is interesting and more than the partner it depends on who is leading the project and also on the echo that the project uh, gets uh, within the within the within like the company so of course startups are totally different beasts and large companies and however it's um, i mean it's in, it's not even necessary. This beneficial to you know to, to this kind of complementarity is also what what it is important. What when what is very you know like I mean this brings a lot of I mean gives a lot of strength on the path of bringing something to the market. You know because large companies have first of all credibility, experience, but also you know um, yeah I mean also like the knowledge breadth and, uh, and many things um, but 
but it is actually quite interesting that you see from different companies even all large ones that it can be very different experience that you have with some they're very agile very fast very responsive some they are really like more like the state conglomerate uh, some other are uh, have like a like a very down to earth attitude others not of, of our partners but my previous experiences i mean i some somehow encountered sometimes others that have like a different kind of you know you know attitude they are a bit more proud of themselves <laughs> i'm happy to sign up our partners now, uh, now this is none of our actual partners but the previous <laughs> ones they had some that they were actually special <laughs> and um yeah so this perhaps to summarize, I think that you can work very well together. There are very many ways in how you can touch and complement each other. And uh, it's always fascinating how different it can play out in, for the case for different yeah. partners. Well, I, I, I think that's been a fantastic episode. Uh, you've taken us from taking sun, air, or CO2, water, and, and making energy. We've talked about growing a business. Uh, we've gone all over the place, founders. It's been fantastic. I, I want to thank you for being our guest. I, I hope that you've enjoyed uh, the conversation as much as we have, because it's, it's, it's been a great journey. Thank you for being on the show today. Thank, thank you, you very much. It's been a great pleasure. And for our audience, you've uh, enjoyed another episode of Insider's Guide to Energy. If you've enjoyed this conversation, if you're interested in synthetic fuels, check our friends out on the internet. Watch the YouTube channel. It's pretty darn cool. Watch their videos. Watch what they're doing because I thought that was pretty amazing. And I think you will too. Share this with your friends and don't forget to like us and follow us. And we'll talk to you again next week. Bye-bye.